Yuna, Celeste. Come on, girls. There'll be hot chocolate there. That's why it's called the hot chocolate room. Yep, that's one reason. In January? In January. Ooh, I wish I would. There is this, this energy inside that needs to get out, this kind of throbbing intensity that just needs to find expression. Running is boring and painful and lonely sometimes, but Every now and then you get these breakthroughs and you lose yourself in the forest and in the experience. And in those moments, I'm, I'm gone. My body is just running itself. And that's what happened when I won the race. I'm an average runner who just tries really hard, but I was never any kind of national caliber runner until I, I ran the Copper Canyon Ultra. Yeah, the whole way, I'm running beside virtually barefoot runners. Here I am in my Nikes and socks, and they're wearing nothing but tire tread strapped to their feet with goat leather. So it didn't really even seem like I was running against them anyway. It's, it felt like two different races. And somehow, I felt something take, take over. and. I surged forward to the front of the pack and ended up winning that race with mixed emotion. Krista McDougal actually contacted me a few weeks before I went down to the canyons and sent me a copy of the book. That book became popular the year I won the Ultra. Winning that race suddenly put me on a national stage that I had never been on before. I was given interviews to ESPN and talking to national magazines and I felt totally out of my league and not worthy. But that one day, for one race, everything had come together for me at just the right time. And suddenly, I was a spokesperson for the Taramara and the race. It forced me to reevaluate a lot of things. bought this land and started putting the infrastructure in. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. I read everything I could and continued going down to visit the Taramara to learn how they farmed and how they lived and slowly built this farm to model the Taramara Rancho using very minimal equipment, try to keep it as simple and close to the ground as the Taramara do. After that race, it changed me into becoming more of a Taramara-like person. I can never even come close to being what they are, but it's something that I started aspiring to be.
Okay, we have to leave in 10 minutes, okay? Okay, you have to eat. Don't touch the computer with sticky hands, okay? He has to go to work, to, he actually has to go to work today, like he has to physically be in the office. Will just doesn't do mornings very well. He's like a farmer, runner, disciplined guy that just doesn't do mornings. Come on in, kitties. River, come on, please cooperate. Can you help me out? Yeah. Foot. With your foot. No, no. Please. What I want you to do is I want One, you to get two, your stuffed animals. Three, four, Listen to me. Five, six, stuffed animals and your four. shoes on. Okay, let's do it. Come on. One minute is 82 seconds. Okay. It looks like we're gonna be gone for like a week by the number amount of stuff that we carry out to the car. What's going on today? Are you having any symptoms? Chest pain, shortness of breath? It's still ticking. Hola, amigo. Hey, Will. Will's uh, editor-in-chief of Blue Ridge Outdoors magazine. Yes, sir. Writes some features and some things like that for the magazine as well, but mostly oversees everything editorially that we do. Will works some from home since he lives a uh, pretty good bit outside of town. But typically, any day that he's here, at some point during the day, those workouts will commence. A lot of uh, forceful exertions happening in there. We've learned that when people call or come in, he's sort of in that space and, uh, and he'll get back to them.
What'd you find, another lollipop? Yeah. Okay, you can't have it right now. Daddy no. But I Will would have made a very good monk. Like, I think he really revels in, like, a little bit of self-flagellation. You know, he, like, he wants to suffer. Like, suffering makes him feel better about himself because he knows that the rest of the world is suffering and that if he's not suffering also, then he's forgetting. He's been gone some where he's had to do long runs, but I think I'm just used to it. And I try to just have some sort of activity planned so I have something to do with River. I think it's a mental, I mean, I think his family has a predisposition towards depression and anxiety, and sometimes people need to take medicine, but you can also exercise. So I think his brain needs it. Like, I think this is what keeps him well. Rara Hippery. The Taramara don't run point to point, start to finish races. For centuries, they've run Rara Hippery, an ancestral ball kicking race. Arnulfo and his clan travel from their ejido to the canyon floor near the Enrique River. Slaughtering an ox is part of the pre-race festivities that fuels them for the long run ahead. The wooden ball used is carved from a sacred tree. The women run their own race, an arueta, flinging a wooden ring with sticks. Honorame is feliz porque correr rara hippie. I played soccer for my whole life. I thought this would be easy. Not only does it hurt, but this ball is unpredictable and you've got to get underneath it and lift it every time. And it's, it's, it's wood. Korama is the central belief of the Taramara culture. It means giving selflessly, without expectation of reward. The Taramaras, they don't really practice, you know, they just walk in the mountains, but they never practice. Last year it was very close. Our new for one, they beat us, but we want to beat him this time. The big star in our team is Miguel Lara. He's a 20 years old boy. He's the winner of the ultra marathon. 
Most of my life, I've been obsessed with Arnulfo, and he's synonymous with, with champion among the Raramri, and he'll always be a legend. And Miguel is kind of the next wave, perhaps the next Arnulfo. Ah. <laughs> There's a lot of mystery in these races. We have a shaman or witch doctor. We need to do a cleansing to, to bless the, the runners, to protect, protect them from the other, the other team. Blouse is made for someone about five foot rather than six. I feel kind of like an imposter, but I'll try to try to live up to it. <sighs> same, que same question. Uh, can you tell us your name? Will Harlan? El Chivo? El Chivo. El Chivo. We know that you won the Caballo Blanco Marathon two years ago. Three years ago. Yeah. What it means for you to win this race? It is the most meaningful race of my life. No dying on the run. If they die, they're disqualified. Muertos prohibido. <laughs> They'll run back and forth. They'll do basically a three kilometer loop and they'll do 20 of those loops. If any team gets lapped, that's the end of the race. I'm gonna be running with them, but I'm not gonna be kicking the ball. It's cada vuelta que pasa, quitamos una piedra. Cada vuelta, quitamos una piedra y es una, una vuelta. They give them pinole, which is a drink that they made out of corn. They give energy to the runners. Batapilas <laughs> runners remember how to run because they're more traditional. So you know how to run in a team, they play more ball races. The Eureka runners were relying on uh, Miguel Lara, their best runner. There wasn't as much teamwork because they don't run so much anymore, they don't practice together. So it's a matter of remembering how and hopefully with uh, these races, the people will re-realize the whole goal behind all this. It's unpredictable. You never know what's going to happen with a bull race. The Tupilas wanted to run like a loop more just for the fun of it. No one in there 
Oraches could ever do what they just did. And that was a short Rara Hippie. I mean, that was the most incredible athletic performance I've ever witnessed. You know, I could smell and taste and feel it maybe a little closer, but I didn't do anything. I switched into shoes two-thirds of the way through. I never kicked the ball, and I am beat down. You can't understand for a second how hard that is to kick a ball through that loose rock that's untoppable. He was three or four when he really started playing things and wanted to be, he always wanted to be the best in everything, all the time. He played Little League baseball, football, soccer. He wrestled in high school. He was really good in school. His reading level was just so far beyond, apparently, the rest of the, the kids in his grade that they couldn't keep him stimulated enough. Unsafe and even dangerous. You know, he, they have to kind of dumb him down to, to be in the same level as the other kids, so they kind of nicely suggested that we move him to a school, a public school, where they had a gifted program and they got the tax dollars to support it. So we did that, and I'm glad we did, because he really flourished. And the orange pants and the white shirt coming by right now. I wasn't any big competitive runner or anything, but I just learned to start running and jogging and so forth. I can't remember how old he is. He was pretty young, but he wanted to, to go with me. I said, sure. Men. And under. First place at a time of 47.54, Bill Harlan. Yes. First place, Bill Harlan. He kind of picked it up from there and saw how much fun it was. Before long, he was bugging me every day. Let come on, let's go running. Jay Singer. One ten over sixty four. Fabulous. Hey, Will. Dr. Robertson. I understand you got a foot problem. This is the first bone I've ever broken. I've oh, never wow. had anything like this. So it's the fifth metatarsus. Yeah. It's on the yeah. Other. yeah, I can see it swollen from here. But all these other little piggies are all right. Yeah, they're just ugly. Force all right. Yeah, that's okay. Little tender on the fourth. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty good bony callus you got there. Yeah. It's even that little bit of. Yeah, hurt. I mean, I can feel it. It's not like. Not like putting weight on it. Excruciating, but it's definitely. You know, it's just about like any other kind of uh, bone fracture. It's going to take four to six weeks to heal. Uh, but, you know, most times people have just a little teeny crack. And, you know, a lot of times they can still walk in tennis shoes and just not run and not get on their toes. and but it looks like yours is worse than that. Shucks. <laughs> so what's your plans, more races? Well, I was planning to go to uh, the Copper Canyons again. And I'd say that one's out. Yeah. <laughs> I might go to, to watch at least, but yeah, um, you could do that. there's well, a big... Uh, I don't think you'd run. I don't think you'd run. In fact, I don't think you'd be run. I, you, you may, you'll be walking fine then, I think, but I don't think you'll be able to even jog by then as much reaction you got there.
I remember when he hurt his leg in college and he couldn't run. He was really upset about it, but then he, he started swimming. And, and so now he's a really good swimmer, but he just had to do that every day. Where there's a will, there's, where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> I can't run, so I've amped up my routine of sit-ups, push-ups, pull-ups, and planks. And I'm swimming every other day too. But it's all I can do to keep sane and somewhat fit while wearing this goddamn boot. Took his shirt off, I thought maybe he's going running. He said, no, I gotta go in the other room and do my push-ups. And he's in there doing his push-ups and, and sit-ups and stuff for at least an hour. I mean, he goes and goes and just, I don't know, I, I didn't even wanna ask him how many he's doing. It's gotta be tough, because you know, all that physical activity and all the endorphins, and all of a sudden you shut that off, it's almost like a withdrawal from a drug. For someone that has to do athletics every day, and you don't, you're crabby, it's like if you didn't eat breakfast or lunch, you'd be a little crabby by dinner time. <laughs> That's how, that's how he is. In a lot of conversations we've had with him, we've kind of encouraged him, like, you know, you can't be doing this forever, taking off and going these things where you just, you know, run yourself in the ground. We're just afraid he might really injure himself. What I want you to do is I want you to drop that knee, that left knee, just like that, mm -hmm, and then back up. She has been one of the top female ultra runners in the United States for a long time. For you? She's won so many big races and national championships at just so many different distances. And now her forte is 24-hour races. Her PR is a little over 140 miles, which is, I think, top five or six in the, ever for North America. You think about all the things you do in 24 hours, you know, just going about your daily business, eating, sleeping, interacting with people. And to think about taking that entire chunk of time and doing one thing, running, it's just, it's hard to conceive of. And back out. I just kept feeling like, oh, I can manage this. It's not bad, you know, enough ice. I'm not a big ibuprofen taker, so I really wasn't taking any meds to mask it or anything, but I was just feeling like, oh, it'll, it'll go away if I stretch enough. And then it just reached a point where just suddenly it went from being maybe four, five, six on a pain scale to being like off the charts, you know, 10 plus, so where I couldn't work, couldn't, do anything. It was the only thing on my mind. Ended up having surgery. This was my second back surgery, but I was surprised after that that I was able to come back and do the 24-hour distances. And I feel like I kind of got away with something last time. So I'm trying to take a different approach this, this time around and sort of think long-term health, long-term physical comfort as a human being, not just as an athlete. And realizing that maybe it is time to move into a different phase. Your head hurts really badly. You know, if he wanted to race more and, and to put it out there like some of the other guys, he's probably one of the best in the country. But he chooses not to be, and that's part of what I like about Will. Can we come a lot of people tend to look at what Mark and I and Will do as obsessive and maybe even an addiction of sorts. And maybe it is, but there are certainly worse addictions you can have. We usually sit down and talk about like who's doing what this week and try to map it out because we have a daughter, a 13 year old daughter. We both have full time jobs and we've been running and racing for so many years now that you know, we've gotten it down pretty good. But it is a lot of plan pre planning. So you'd come straight back from the beach, get in the car, and drive to Missouri? Oh, no, I'm coming back from the beach on Monday. And so we would leave on Tuesday or Wednesday, for, right? Or... Yeah, then we might as well fly. Exactly. Also, I have down that River's graduation is actually Wednesday, May 22nd. It is, so I had it right. Are you sure? That's what I've written down, but let's... I may have written it right down. I checked the website yesterday. It's the 22nd. So it means I took off the wrong day. I have to take off that day too. The first gentleman as soon as possible. Mr. King. Call me back, Agent Gedge. This is extremely important.
my foot has kept me from really training much. I'm getting on the bike a little bit, doing my push-ups and sit-ups, but I'm definitely not in shape to be running 50 miles. It takes some effort to get down here. It's close, but it's so far away. That highway that brings you into the town of Eureka, it was quite a, quite a surprise. Eureka is a nice little town in the bottom of the canyon. Its economy is based on favors and small businesses. People buy something from somewhere where it's inexpensive and they truck it here and they sell it for a few pesos more. It's pretty well to do municipal due to mining and other natural resources. This little town has gone from a dark, dusty, backwards, sad, lonely place. And each year, a little bit more color, a little bit more festivity, a little bit more, some more runners were coming. And now it's become an event that the entire town has become part of. I think just about every citizen of Eureka is out in the streets right now. There's very few towns where you can get nearly unanimous participation in an event. And this is in a town that's at the crossroads of major drug trafficking. And the kids are playing in the streets and shooting hoops and staying out late and playing music. Even as trucks with tinted windows drive by, you know, it's remarkably a real community still. I always hated having to comb your hair and style it. It just seemed like such a waste. I had poofy hair, really thick, poofy helmet hair as a kid. I read a lot of Buddhist stuff. The monks shave their heads. I don't want to be a monk. I like sex too much, but it makes me less vain. You're worried about your hair. You're worried about your appearance. And when I shaved off my hair, I stopped caring about how I looked. The race started with the idea that I wanted to run with the Raramri. I'm kind of selfish. I wanted to run with them. I was a pretty good runner and I invited some Aramri to hike over to the town of Arike with me where I bought them the hotel in Arike. I bought their meals and we raced back. Manuel Luna won those earlier races. He won by one minute over second place, Felipe Quimere, another Quimere. Then Arnolfo started joining us. Arnolfo started winning. Arnolfo won in 2004, 2005. 2006, the most renowned art ultra runner in the world, probably. Scott Jurek, El Venado, the deer, came down to run with us. And Arnolfo from the bottom of Canyon that very few people have ever heard of won over Scott Jurek. That race was the race featured in the book Born to Run by Christopher McDougall. I read the book uh, Born to Run. Uh, I think, why not? I will come here to visit uh, Mexico and then run with Caballo Blanco the 50 English miles. I, I think the book really presents some ideas and concepts that are so approachable, that are so relatable. Many, many people want to do what the book talks about. Very influential book when it comes to long distance running and then the advent of uh, people trying to do the barefoot thing. So I always had a lot of pain when I ran and I read the book Born to Run. It changed everything for me. I started running differently because you have to when you run barefoot. I just really wanted to see for myself what it was all about and, and, and really to be able to run with, with the Rari M M Rara M Marie. I work for Microsoft full time. I found running to be a good compliment and so for me I wanted to come down here and meet other people and really hang out with other people like me. Some of these folks are very wealthy entrepreneurs. Some come from big running communities. So it's great that there's so much publicity and there's so much attention down here because the Mexican government 
is forced to value these people not as second-class citizens but as legitimate Mexicans who have just as much right to their ancestral land and deserve food and rights just the same as anyone else. We've got 500 runners showed up. A lot of people are running for corn because it was a hard year. Anybody who finishes wins maize. Well, we have a great competitive race this year between well, Will Harlan El Chivo, winner of 2009, Hiroki Ishikawa, El Dragon de Japon, who also ran in 2009. We have Herman Silva here, the great former Olympian of the uh, Mexico Olympic team who won the New York Marathon twice in the 90s. My guess is that a foreign runner, probably a shoe running wear, would have to have a better opportunity of winning this race. Bill Harlan or something? We have lots of good Raramri. I think they are born on the, on the sandals, and they are running every day, the mountain up, mountain down. I have no idea who's going to win, but the likelihood it's going to be a gringo who has a haircut similar to mine, but it's not going to be me. My name is Stephanie Gardner. I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, I came down with my boyfriend, Sean Wood, who's also running. I think he ran this race last year but dropped out, so this year he's just really hoping to finish. So I'm helping in any way that I can. We have a group of friends here. There's like about eight of us. So I tried to like make them breakfast and just get whatever they need for when they're running. Just simple things like chapstick and sunblock that they might have overlooked. And I'm just hanging out and making friends and getting the tan. <laughs> First place, he is from Czechoslovakia, and second is Miguel. Climb to Los Alisos and back down at 50K is kind of a crucial part of the course. Endured a really hot and steep climb up there and you're gonna run back the way you came. And if you're feeling good from Los Alisos, you can run that trail pretty swiftly. You can run it pretty smooth. If you're feeling like crap, it's not gonna help you. pretty screwed up. My hip and my knee are in pretty bad shape. Coming down the mountain to Ron Hoi, took a nice spinning header. So up here around my hip and my knee are pretty, pretty in pretty bad shape. Yeah, Daniel! Ixtale! Andale, amigo! Front Danielle was running at a really blazing clip and it looks like it caught up to him. He's cramping up real bad.
We'd give them a, a half liter water bottle at the aid station. They'd take two hits, chuck it, and it's gonna be a hot day, and my concern is to have water later when it's needed. Danielle broke the record by 15 minutes, but Miguel broke it by 20. 645 was the winner, then 650 came in second. You broke the record! You broke, you broke the record, Jambian. He had it in his eyes. A kid from the canyons. Glass by him and just pulled out just an amazing victory. That's just that's so sweet. I never had aspirations for first, but I've been running my whole life since I was five, and I've never, ever not finished a race. I've had pneumonia, I've run through injuries, I've it's just never happened before. That's wonderful, wonderful, Will. What, a, what spirit. He's the 
Crazy Runner. residency and it was friendship at first sight. We were interns together going through the good, the bad and the ugly. And with Emily came Will and he is an interesting character. Jerry Seinfeld's back in prime time with the marriage ref, Thursday nights at 10 p.m. Eastern on NBC. Jerry says all married couples have them. Ongoing quarrels, tips and spats that just never seem to get resolved. Our viewer, Emily, from North Carolina, says that she's been losing sleep over her issue with her husband. Take a look at this. My husband, Will, is a very unique person. He's truly one of a kind. You can see there's only one side of the bed that's been slept on, and that's mine. Daddy. We're going to go show you where Daddy sleeps. And there he is, sleeping on the screened in porch in 17 degree weather. Hi, honey. I definitely remember Emily saying that for at least two or three weeks after that, she was talking about it all day. So patients were asking questions about it. So, honey, why do you sleep out on the porch when it would be so much nicer for us to sleep together in the same bed <laughs> where it's warm and cozy and we can be together? I always love sleeping out under the stars, um, hearing the sound of the creek. But we don't get to spend a lot of time together with our two-year-olds, so wouldn't it be nice if we had that time together? I guess I have dreams of hiking the Appalachian Trail, and uh, that's not going to happen anytime soon, so I brought the trail to my backyard. What's your take on their sleeping sitch, Jerry? <laughs> I love this under the stars. He's in a porch with a roof on. There's no stars. You can't <laughs> yeah, see yeah, any yeah, stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You hear the creek for four seconds. You're asleep. You can't hear a creek yeah. when you're asleep. He's, he's, He's out of his mind. He needs to go to camp in the summer with the other kids. He needs to go to camp in the summer. I think it's fine that you have, you know, deluded yourself into thinking you enjoy this, which is fine. <laughs> but not if it's upsetting your wife, you know, a little compromise. I don't think we have to go right. Just compromise, maybe, some of the time, sleep in the bed. OK. I mean, if you miss a night out there, is it that bad? <laughs> what do you think you're going to miss? Bad, a cricket? For her sake, um, you know, when I get up in the middle of the night, the bed creaks. She gets upset if I miss the toilet or don't put the, the toilet lid down. So now I can sleep outside and pee in the bucket. And uh, who empties the bucket? I, I actually carry it out to the compost <laughs> pile once a month. So it's, that's my job. Oh, the dog oh, is out. Oh, 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 thank God. God. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe even in the build up to Mexico, he was doing more spontaneous big runs around here where he would just kind of get up at three in the morning and go to South Carolina and Emily would find out after he was gone that he was going to run a marathon today. I mean, how much does she know when he's in trouble till it's over? He doesn't tell her until it's over. I know she knows that. He might not survive one of his adventures. I mean, I think that's always in the back of her mind. I went to med school at Emory, where he went to college. Most of the people in my class were, had actually gone to college with Will. So they're like, oh, you're dating that guy that we always used to see running around campus, you know, at midnight. <laughs> I really liked going out to nice dinners. That was like my idea of a nice evening is have a glass of wine and try all the different restaurants in Atlanta. And that is funny because that's not him. Even then, that wasn't him. I think he had these values and he had this intention of living this way, but he too didn't know sort of how to get there. And I think it's been a path for him. 
He's, he's always been drawn to, you know, Native Americans or indigenous people as sort of being very pure and sort of living uh, this idea of a life that is in harmony with the earth. I think there was a time before we had River where he thought about just training full time and trying to get a sponsorship. One thing he realized early on with running is that runners like to talk about their times and their next race. You know, his whole sort of purpose in life is to be selfless. And, you know, it, it felt selfish to him to spend so much time running and training and almost in a way to justify the amount of time and energy that he's put into it. He needed to make it meaningful. And when he found the Taramara, it seemed such a perfect match for him because here was a group of people that were indigenous and native and elicited, you know, sort of the things that he'd always cared about and respected, and their runners and their, I mean, it just, it all clicked for him. You know, I'm gonna get home from work at, you know, 6.30, and chances are, you know, he'll still be finishing exercise and, you know, it's not like I can walk in and be like, hey, we're home, can you stop now? I mean, I've moved the, beyond the point of anger. There are days that I'm frustrated with it, but I don't think we would have had a relationship that would have worked if I hadn't just accepted that it was, you know, a member of our marriage. My left foot is a mess. The MRI showed a partially torn Achilles and the doc recommended surgery. Running is supposed to be healthy, not harmful. I've pushed my body as hard and as far as it can go. Now the injuries are piling up. You have to manage the athlete to facilitate them recovering, whether with surgery or without. An Achilles is, is, you know, about four to six weeks in some sort of immobilization, and then four to six weeks in a, a therapy program before you're really actually out running again. We see runners that become so upset because they are so obsessed that they can't function. We like to treat them conservatively, hold them back really from themselves, and then uh, get them back to what they love to do. Getting them back to their routine is the therapy. My back doesn't tolerate. I was probably training 15 to 20 hours a week, plus the hidden amount of time it takes is just the amount of extra sleep you require when you're training, the extra time preparing food so you're eating healthy, stretching, icing, all those kinds of things. Had another injury this winter, and at this point, we're not sure whether it's another back problem or if it's originating from another area, but I'm convinced now that the uh, competitive part of my running career is over. It's frustrating as we get older to keep pushing and climbing back and trying to get back to our previous levels of performance, even though biology is against us. I spend every morning, sometimes twice a day, with Juno. She's literally fed me now for two years. Every morning I drink her milk on my cereal. I think Juno's my favorite. Uh, reception was in a barn right next to the farm, and the actual ceremony was out in a, in a pasture. It was a beautiful ceremony. Everything turned out wonderfully, but at the time, her parents were were pretty irate with with me and, and tried all sorts of, of ways to try to get me to put my shoes on and wear a tie, and I just wouldn't do it. But right before the, the wedding, there she was behind the barn with a bunch of goats nibbling at her dress. And uh, to me, that was just the most magical moment, even more than the exchange of vows or anything else, just seeing her for the first time peeking out from behind the barn. Um, I was just totally enamored and enchanted and, and the goats all around her, I thought, this is our future. These are frames that go in the beehives. They've got to be cleaned out and replace the wax. We'll keep some of this wax. This is comb, basically, that the bees have made. They fill all of these with honey, and we've pulled out all the honey from the wax, from the 
from what they've built, the, the, the honeycomb, and then you can use this to make, make candles out of. They produce something called royal jelly, which is what they feed their queen, which is some of the most nutritionally powerful stuff on the planet, just incredibly nutrient dense and is used even medicinally for all sorts of things. And then they produce this wax, which you know can be used to make candles and all sorts of crafts. We're actually doing this Jewish dance that they do at every wedding. I can't remember what it's called. But we were pretty clear that this was gonna be our own ceremony because we were creating our own lives here in Asheville. You know, both of our families are far away and we had to, we've had to go it on our own here. Um, raising a kid, raising a farm. Um, it's been something we knew that we would be doing by ourselves. And our families have been supportive, but it's really just, just Emily and I getting things done out here. It will probably be right-handed. Right. Yeah. But what if it's a boy, what is your favorite name? Max. I like that. How about if it's a girl? Sophia. Oh. Sophia. Sophia. Mm, wow. I love Sophia. You don't remember that? Maybe that's everything coming into him. That's how he eats and drinks. So that's because the baby doesn't have any food in there. Like, can't feed him peanut butter and jelly. Oh, sandwiches. I thought that was like how hot everything gets into him, like his soul and stuff. Yeah. Well, his. Yeah, no, his. We don't know how Is his soul. Is that vagina right there? That's right. His soul's there. That's where it comes out? Yep. It comes out. Right through there. Right through there, yep. So then, I see his head. I see his, it's like here he's... There, like there's his sword. backbone and his heart. Fine. Oh, I see his heart. Oh. There's his heart. Oh, there's his heart. Does it sound like a horse? Yeah. That's the heart. It looks like it's windy out there. It's windy in there. Usually I just do it like out in the, the hallway of the, the airport. I'll just put down a towel. I'll just do sit-ups and push-ups. I mean, it seems perfectly normal to me. I mean, people are reading books, and what's the big deal about doing push-ups and sit-ups and planks? You know, if I saw someone doing that, I wouldn't think that was a big deal. But for Emily, it's pretty, pretty horrifying. Can you personalize taking on board? Let's see what a fan you over there in front of you. I know there's a lot more few that stand out. She's a very punctual, timely person. I'm very organized, but I tend to be on the late side because I'm trying to do too much and cram everything in. Whenever we go to the airport, there's always a fight because I'm always a little bit late and she's super anxious. If I get in there on time, one time I said, okay, why don't we drive separately? I just gotta do one thing at the office and then I'll meet you at the airport. And I realized that I had written down the wrong time for our flight. And so I was an hour late, so the flight was gone. And it was actually for her grandfather's 90th birthday. And it was a surprise party, and it had been planned for months. And her whole family was, was there waiting. Another time, Emily was running her first marathon. You know, she had been my crew for dozens of races. So finally, I was getting a chance to return the favor. I told her I was just going to run the first 13 miles myself and meet her there. But I was running so fast. I was running a personal best. Like, I was way ahead of the fastest time I'd ever run for 13 miles. So I couldn't just stop. I was feeling great. So I just kept going. And I ran the best time I've ever run. But I didn't meet Emily for any of the aid stations. She ended up breaking her foot. So I felt really bad. Yeah. I mentioned it to her much later. Yeah, I'd also run the marathon and actually run a personal record. So you can see a pattern. I tend to disappear unexpectedly and leave her in awkward situations and make her cry. But, you know, she she was happy for me. I mean, that's typical Emily. I do something douchey and she she just rolls with it. 
Yeah. When I came to Riket, the first I, I saw was the wall with the names, and I thought, I would be nice, my name there, together with Will Harlem, with uh, Arnulfo Kimarai, with all the winners, the past winners. After I, I, I run marathons, and I retire because I injure in my low back. So I had to be very, very uh, patient to recover. I used to run over 160, 170 miles a week. I was so completely blocked out in terms of nobody can touch my time. And it's so much egoist because it, it really takes away from you the privilege to enjoy your family, enjoy the people around. There is a very thin line between passion and uh, obsession. And uh, you have to be always in the passion side. My main goal is not to win the race, it's just to carry on the vision of sharing perspective of Caballo. The first time I met him, it was like, a, I, I like this idea. Bringing the whole community into one. I wanted to come down here to Enrique and pretty much pay homage to the Tarumara and uh, Micah True and give back something that they've, you know, given to me. Seeing all the festivities and the Tarumara, you know, dressed in their traditional outfits, it's something you can't read about in a book. I spend my free time chasing PRs, or I could devote myself to helping the Taramara. Emily and I have always dreamed of dedicating ourselves to something larger. A nonprofit called Native Seeds got the seeds from the Taramara, kept them in a seed bank, grew them out on farms in Arizona, which was not too much different from, from the canyons. A lot of these are native varieties, indigenous heirloom varieties. Guadalupe. Hola, amigo. ¿Qué dice mi amigo? Sí, sí. Bien. I mean, look at the sand. I mean, it's like trying to grow something in a beach. You know, there's just no organic matter. So for them to have this much flourishing in early March is pretty impressive. There's purple-eyed 
black beans and all different varieties of dent and flint corn and just some really cool varieties of seeds that only grow well here in, in this climate in, in these canyons. And so if they have another drought or another food shortage, they'll be able to access the seeds right here in the canyons rather than having seeds shipped from the States. Mm. Yeah. I've been asking, what do the Taramara need? What, what do they want? Porque um, no dinero for Minguera or no agua? Sí. What the Taramara keeps saying to us is seeds and they want water. Just like human diversity and species diversity, there's food diversity, and that's really important to the Taramara. Not just growing any old bean or corn, but one that's going to survive the winters here and thrive in these sandy soils. This is what a Taramara rancho used to look like. You know, beans, corn, fruit trees, a variety of different crops, greens, fertile soil, water, and this is what used to be scattered all over the canyons, and drought and land rights and drug wars have caused them to, to lose their land and lose their traditions and lose access to reliable water and have to eat all their seeds because they have nothing else to eat. So this, I would say, is, is the long-term vision. And to get there, they need to get their land rights back. They need to get a healthy supply of water through tapping a lot of the springs up higher up in the canyons and they need access to the seeds that they've grown for centuries. And so one step at a time, we're trying to get there, and this is a good start. I love these. These are the seeds that I found. I know that's what you wanted. That's what I was trying to get for you. Do you want me to move your breakfast over here? Uh -huh. Ram at Blue 14 back with you, and this is the Oregon Ducks yep. Championship game. I'm going to go outside, oh, okay? Finally made you hear it, me? Guys. We're playing Texas yeah, okay. A&M this game in the National Championship, so that is awesome. Good guys. Rock solid. Let's get that out of here. Yeah. Every day, River said, is Daddy coming home today? Oh, no, that's right. He's going to be home in however many more days. So he's keeping track of it. I don't like the one that's so talking. I don't like these. You don't want this one? Yeah, because they're all like talking and no football day. Oh, OK. Well, let's find a different one, then. In years past, he's called me, like, after the race. I'm hoping that he'll call tonight. Starting quarterback on a and at that. I can't remember the time difference there. I think it's a couple hours, and I can't remember what time it starts there, but we woke up thinking about him. He keeps saying, well, you know, do you think he'll win? Because right at this age, he's into winning. I feel like Will's not going down to like win the race again. I feel like he already did that. I think it's about just going down to maintain relationships and stay involved. And I mean, I'm sure he would love to try to win, but I don't think he really has that in his mind as something that's a possibility necessarily. I think he's just going for the experience of being there and 
making sure all the things that he's working on are going well and seeing Arnolfo and... So I don't really feel nervous about it. I feel like the first year he went when he actually won, you know, and I had a little baby and that I was nervous. Where did you move me? Uh, you can't move me that far. Actually, uh, that was just not fair. That was just... Did you move me, yes or no? Oh, uh, that was just where I was in the last thing. Okay, did you do anything? No. My, my turn, though. Knowing Will Harlem and knowing that he's an ultramarathon runner and knowing that he has in his heart the competitive side, it doesn't matter what you say. If you enter in a race, you want to try to win it. And I know if he, he wants one time here, and why not retiring yourself from winning a race? <laughs> They're on the brink of survival. Whether they show up for the gringo races depends primarily on if they'll be able to get corn year after year. That makes it worth the caloric expenditure. <laughs> Pain opens my eyes to the suffering of others. I'm feeling something that other people are feeling constantly on a daily basis, whether it's hunger or pain or fatigue. And of course, mine is artificial. Mine is finite, and theirs isn't. I don't want to dwell too much on suffering and be some kind of sadistic, masochistic, depressed freak show, but I also don't want to lose sight of them. I know that my suffering in a race is temporary, that there's a finish line for me, and then it's over and I can go back to my comfortable lifestyle, but for everyone else, there is no finish line. That's probably why I suffer every day. I didn't want Enrique's last memory of me to be me collapsed on the side of the road puking. I wanted them to know that I finish what I start. 
even though it was incredibly painful to do so, and I wanted to quit at about mile 10. I just didn't want to fall down. I just wanted to make it all the way across the finish line this year. Only you know if you win as deep as you possibly can, and, and I know today that took everything I had. For the past few years, I've been kind of chasing the, the kid I once was, but now I'm okay just being the, the old man that I am. I think I'm ready to, to be a dad and a coach and a farmer and a writer and a husband. I think I've got a lot, a lot to do, a lot to look forward to. Okay, girls. Just stole the first and run out.